Luke 24, 13 to 35. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place over the last few days? He said to them, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago. But there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things, just as the women had said. They didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, your dull minds kept, keep you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all of the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all of the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he act as, acted as if he was going on ahead, but they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, Weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? They got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, The Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon. Then the two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. The word of the Lord. This is one of my favorite stories in that entire book that we call the Bible. One of. It's a resurrection story. It's a communion story. It's a journey story. It's the story about the presence of God amongst us and strangers that we meet along the way. I could probably go on and on and on. I love the hearing and the telling and the sharing of this story for so many reasons. Were not our hearts on fire within us when he was present? We couldn't quite tell, but something, something had changed. I think it's a powerful text in the way that it ends, but it's also a powerful text in the way that it begins. I, know I will be the first to admit too often I have overlooked the first verses of this story so that I could race to the end where Jesus shows up. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's guilty of that. That's where we want to get in these stories, right? We always want to get to the part where Jesus arrives. But sometimes we need to stop. We need to pause and set 
within the beginnings of these stories where Christ's presence isn't felt, where he seems distant or absent or away. We have these two people who are walking away from Jerusalem, and if you caught it at the beginning of the, reason, the reading, it was on that same night. The hint there being this is Easter Sunday evening. This is right after the story of the resurrection. So don't let the fact that it's a couple weeks later now that we're talking about it distract you from when this story took place. It was that very night. So they were close enough to have known the story of the women going to the tomb and discovering it empty. But they didn't know much beyond that. And they were at a loss. They were taking that long road home from Jerusalem in defeat. We had hoped. We had hoped that he was the Messiah who was going to restore Israel. We had hoped he was going to be the one that would restore our relationships to God. And here we are going home. He's been crucified. His body is missing. It would seem that all is lost. There's something powerful about the idea of two friends or two family, whomever they may have ultimately been. The story doesn't tell us much about them, but the fact that they were journeying together and they were sharing and they were lamenting and they were discerning and they were processing and trying to figure out what had just happened because we had hoped, implying, had, no longer, now. And yet, in their sharing with one another, the presence of the stranger, the presence of Christ, emerges. And then in the breaking of the bread, it becomes alive and they recognize in that moment that something powerful has taken place. Amen. But they had to get through the first part of the day. They had to move through the questions and the pain and the hurt and the feeling that God was absent in that moment when they needed God most. Surely they are not the only two people who have ever been in that space. Surely this is an experience that we all have shared at different times in our life. God, where are you? I am feeling pain. I am feeling hurt. I am confused. I have questions. I have doubts. I have fears. Where are you, O oh God? We feel defeated. We're looking, but we can't find you. This past week, I went on Monday evening into Seattle and I went to a service of remembrance for the Holocaust at Temple de Hirsch Sinai. Uh, I have the great gift of my cousin being a rabbi in that community, but it was also a great gift to come and to share in this service. They did what I thought was a beautiful thing and they tied the questions of the present day, refugees who are fleeing war, who are fleeing for their lives, and put that together with the stories of the Holocaust and those who wanted to flee, who were desperate to save their own lives. It was a compelling and jarring experience all at the same time, but I remembered the story of a person there she was sharing uh, and she works with an aid relief agency for refugees, but she shared a uh, remembrance of traveling in Europe. And in her travels, she was able to visit a couple of the death camps and to see the places where this great Holocaust was enacted, where those who could not flee were sentenced to their deaths in these horrible, horrible conditions in horrible, horrible ways. And that in and of itself is enough to put you in a place of walking that long road home and wondering, where is God? Where were you in all of this? And for me, it was a jarring experience. For as she described in detail her encounters with the camps 
in Eastern Europe, my mind began to flood with images of the battery factory in Potocari, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the headquarters for the Dutch battalion outside the enclave of Srebrenica, where the great massacre took place there. I remembered reaching a moment as I was able to step back from that vivid recalling of the memories of that place, the site of the factory where the Dutch peacekeepers holed up in fear for their own lives because they weren't equipped to fight off the Bosnian Serb army, and how they watched as allegedly the Bosnian Serbs divided the men from the women and the children in order to help relocate them to a new safe enclave, but knowing that some of the women and children made it unharmed. Many of the men never left that place. And on that long road home, my cousin was kind enough to give me a ride to the ferry, but on that long ride home on the ferry, I sat with that and the pain and wondering, where is the resurrection in this? Where is God in this? I don't come to you this morning to tell you that I found my answer. I didn't. I've been searching since I first visited the country in 2008, and I suspect I will be searching until I die. But I did find something in this story that spoke to me this week after making my own long journey home. And that was knowing that we would gather again here as God's people that we would come together and we would be Christ to one another. We may not recognize it always at first. We may not be as aware of the presence of God in this space as we should be. Sometimes it's easier to experience God when we come, bringing the pains and the hurts that we have encountered in our lives. Sometimes when things are going well, it's easier to leave God to the side. But I found comfort in knowing that thanks to having a community of people who gather together in Christ's name, we don't make these journeys alone. None of us takes the long road home by ourselves. And that whether we recognize in the presence of stranger or friend alike, whether we recognize the face of Christ, whenever two or three or four or more of us are gathered together, the presence of Christ can be found and felt. Did Jesus clear up everything for them? It says he walked through the scriptures and tried to explain it to them. I added the tried because I'm not sure that they got it. I'm not sure I would have gotten it. But he spoke to them. And then, as they invited him into their home for dinner that evening, he did something that I hope all of us in this congregation would recognize. <laughs> He took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And suddenly their eyes were open. Yes. And the presence of Christ was visible and felt and known and just as suddenly he was gone. But I tell you the presence of God lingered beyond that appearance, beyond that moment. It was just in that recognition they realized we are Christ to one another. That long road home, it may be long, it may be challenging, but it's never alone. So long as we have and hold one another together in care and in comfort and in prayer. No matter how dark the world may look, how dire our circumstances may seem, we have the gift of finding Christ and of being Christ to one another. So I hope that wherever you are on your journey, whether it is your long road home from Jerusalem with questions and uncertainties, or whether you are celebrating your encounter like Mary with the risen Christ, that called to this place, you will play your role to become one of those people on that Emmaus road, whether it be those heading home 
or the stranger who is bringing Christ to those who need it. And we're preparing shortly to gather at the table for our own meal. What better place for God's presence to be made known to us and through us than in the breaking of the bread and in the sharing of that gift as we bring the trays out and we serve one another, passing the items and the elements down the pews. Sometimes we have to sit at the beginning of that story. But the good news is we are all called to live out the end of that story as well. So may we receive God's blessing and in turn, may we become God's blessing to one another. In Jesus' name, amen.